Hi everyone, welcome back to uh, the lecture on the topic double entry bookkeeping. This is week three, so uh, we are going to continue with this topic and hopefully be able to complete it this week. Um, just a recap before we uh, proceed on with uh, this week. Um, remember we said that accounting is a process. It's a series of tasks, right? It's not just one step. It's a process by which we record, we classify, we summarize um, business transactions uh, so that we are able to provide reports uh, that contains information that will be useful to users to make um, informed economic decisions. Um, we said that uh, how we do that, how we how we how the process is done, uh, how we systematically record these transactions is we use the concept of the accounting equation. And uh, I would like to also uh, recap that the accounting equation represents um, uh, the resources, which are the assets of a particular business, and uh, which is on the left hand side. And on the right hand side of the equation is uh, the uh, claims or the sources of these um, resources or who claims these resources and we said that there are uh, two parties that uh, would likely claim it. one is the owner and the other one are third party or creditors or liabilities um, and then we said that that equation must always balance because it refers to the same thing uh, but looking at it from two different sides so we said that there is a, uh, the, uh, the principle of duality applies when we um, record transactions because every transaction uh, in order for the accounting equation to balance must have at least two effects on the accounting equation right so that was what we we had covered in in the previous week we also covered that um, or I, I tried to actually um, then uh, explain the rationale of how um, five six hundred years ago uh, the accountants actually developed uh, the double entry bookkeeping from this accounting equation formula uh, and and this slide actually summarizes um, that a, a double entry uh, system uh, of accounting using the term debits and credits so um, you know this this particular slide is very important so that you 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 have to memorize that when you increase an asset you have to uh, debit the accounts and when you want to decrease an asset you credit and on the right hand side for liabilities and owners equity when there's an increase uh, then you credit and when there's a decrease you debit okay we also talked uh, a little bit about um, revenues and expenses and its impact on owners equity uh, revenues, when you want to increase, you normally credit that account and when you want to decrease it, you debit that account. All right? But expenses, which is um, usually, usually reduces owner's equity, when you want to increase expenses, then you have to debit that account and when you want to decrease expenses, you, you credit that account. So make sure um, by this week you, you have uh, this particular um, double entry system rule um, uh, remembered and, and memorized before we proceed on. So, so that's where we stopped last week. Uh, and, and in lecture three this week, week three, again, uh, I have three things that I want to accomplish this week. Um, one is uh, uh, to actually talk about the process, how we actually do the recording itself. We now know the rule, we know the account equation as a principle, uh, we also know the double entry system, but how do we actually physically do the entry, do the recording of the transaction? And we will talk about two things, the journal and the ledgers. After that, um, we also want to look at a, a process by which we compile and summarize this information so that we are able to prepare financial reports. Uh, these uh, process are called closing entries and the trial balance. The final thing that I wish to achieve this week is to then go on uh, and talk about the actual financial reports itself. What are the various types of reports that uh, we produce and what are some of the uh, presentation formats that, that, that we need to follow. 
So these are the three things that we want to talk about. We'll start off with the journals and, and the ledgers. All right? Now, um, th this, this, this particular topic is actually looking at records. We're actually looking at the whole process itself. Right? So remember we talked about the fact that um, the, um, uh, each item of assets or liabilities are, are recorded in accounts. Accounts are places where we accumulate all the increases and decreases in every item that represents the accounting equation. But of course, we said we don't use increases or decreases. We use the term debits and credits. But these are individual accounts that uh, are normally stacked together, either in a book form or in a computer printout, all right? and they are called the general ledger. And from these, these detailed accounts, individual accounts that represent the account equation, we will extract the summary of that all right, at the end of the month, at the end of the year, and plug it into our reports, all right, which we'll talk about later on. But what I want to do now is go back on to the left-hand side and, 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 and discuss a little bit about uh, what are the other information, other documents that we need before we can even record transactions into um, the accounts uh, that represents the general ledger. Um, so the principle here is this, every transaction that we record uh, must be uh, real transactions, must be uh, supported, must be verified, must be evidenced okay, by some sort of source document. So you cannot pluck transactions out of the air and just record it down, right? You cannot fantasize the transaction. So the transactions must be supported. And, and these supporting documents are called source documents. Examples of these are things like invoices, bills, receipts, uh, checks checks that we issue. So it can be anything that documents um, the, the amount of the transaction and the nature of the transaction. Right? And these source documents, why is it necessary to have these source documents? Because this source document must or should represent what really happened. This is a real transaction that occurs in a particular business uh, hundreds and thousands of times every day. You know? um, so so, so for example, if you have uh, bought something from someone and the someone has, and the supplier has delivered the product to you, then the supplier must have an invoice to support this. And from the invoice, you then uh, decide what is the entry, what is the effect on the accounting equation, what do you debit and what do you credit. Then, when we when we look at the transaction itself, there are different class classification of these transactions. The most common ones are external transactions. That means the transaction between the company, the business, and someone outside of that business. Uh, that includes when you interact with your suppliers, when you interact with your debtors, your bankers, uh, even when you interact with your employees, when you pay them salary uh, and, and all that. So that is called external transaction. There is, also, however, uh, transactions that are purely internal within the organization. For example, when you, con when you buy raw materials from your supplier, that's an external transaction. But then when you convert the raw material into a product, that's called an internal transaction. Okay? So that needs also an accounting entry to, ac to account for the fact that uh, the, the item has been transformed from raw materials to finished goods, which, which you will learn later on in your course. But um, while it's very important to know that there are internal transactions and external transactions, there's also, it is also important to know when a transaction uh, cannot be recorded uh, or you don't have to record. For example, when you interview an employee, uh, there is a transaction. I mean, there, there, is, a, there is an event, right? but you don't record that transaction. Uh, when you, even, even when you offer, when you go, when, when someone goes and attends an interview in, in a company and, and the company interviews this, this person and the company likes this person and gives him an offer letter to join the company, that is also not considered to be an accounting transaction. So how do you distinguish between an accounting transaction and a non-accounting transaction, a non-transaction event? The simple rule here is that an accounting transaction always involves 
um, or most of the time involves an exchange of resources, right? So when a supplier brings goods to you, then there is an exchange of resources, then uh, there is a transa an accounting transaction, okay? But when you, um, when someone uh, comes to the cinema and, and, and just register or go to a concert and just put their name to, to book a place without paying anything, that is not, not an accounting transaction. So this is the whole process, all right? Now, um, but this process is actually not complete because if you look at the, the process, the point between the source document and the general ledger, uh, there is all, there is, there's another, another um, uh, phase or another part of this accounting system uh, that we, we now want to look into, all right? That, that, that part is called the journal or the book of prime entry, okay? And, and uh, why there is this, there is this uh, uh, record in between the source document and the general ledger is because, because if you look at your general ledger, there are, you, you have one page each of your account, your, all your assets and liabilities, each item, right? Um, it's very difficult for you, as I think I mentioned in lectures last week before, that it's very difficult for you to see whether you have done your uh, duality, you know, your double entry, your, and, and you have actually complied with the duality principle uh, when you are looking at each individual account. So there must be one place where you can actually monitor whether you have increased your assets or you have increased your liability. So that is the, that place is what we call the journal, or some uh, books call it the book of uh, prime entry or the book of original entry. Uh, this is how the journal look like, right? And um, uh, I'm going to try and explain the journal now. And essentially, the journal from from the word journal, it's like a diary. It's a it's a place where we write down, um, you know, the story of the company uh, in chronological order by date, right? And literally, it's actually like a diary where every day we write down the the actual transaction. But of course, this is not no ordinary diary. This diary actually uh, uh, identifies uh, which account we debit, which account we credit. So if you look at the journal, uh, number the, the 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 part label number one is is the date, right? And and it's that's 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 uh, very important to always date your journal. This date goes with the date of the transaction. So every transaction on every date will be dated accordingly, and you will date it in, in, in the sequence of time, in chronological order. And then if you look at item 2 and item 4, these are the description of the relevant accounts that you are going to, that, that this transaction has an impact on, and you will uh, you know, either increase or decrease that, that, uh, those uh, accounts. Um, and if you look just below um, that, that two uh, uh, particular account, I, item label 6, that, that, that item is actually the story. That item is actually a description of the transaction. Right? So in this case, it's to record services rendered in exchange for cash. So the two accounts that is involved is cash will go up and your service fee revenue will increase. Okay? Um, and then if you look to the middle uh, in, in the, uh, the, the item label 8, that I, those items are actually references to the general ledger where the, this account will be. Uh, you can say it's a page number uh, or it's actually, a, we call it the folio reference where uh, it's, it's a reference number for each page uh, in, in the general ledger. So that it's easy for you to go and look into the general ledger. <coughs> And finally, um, on the far right of this journal, uh, on the uh, place label 3 and 5, this is the actual amount that this transaction uh, has incurred or, or involves. And uh, you, you then indicate whether you are debit, how much you are debiting cash at bank, if you are increasing cash at bank, and how much you are crediting uh, service fee revenue if you are increasing service uh, fee revenue. And, and this is very important because this is the, the part where you also make sure that the duality principle applies in the sense that 
the debit side, the left hand side, must equal to the credit side, the right hand side. Okay, so this this is where you do your check to make sure that um, your your duality principle is complied with. And then then you go on to to write the next transaction and the next transaction and the next transaction and 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 the label seven. Uh, just explains that you actually um, differentiate one transaction over another by leaving a space, right? So you don't write them uh, very very close together. So this is some. This is basically what we call a journal, and um, this is uh, some of the conventions, some of the practices that we we follow when we actually do this this particular journal. Now what we're going to do is we give you an example. Uh, to illustrate how this is done, uh, we go back to if you recall the example of the uh, when, when we did exercise during lectures last week. Uh, we talk about George. Remember George the butcher, um, and George actually introduced five thousand pounds into a personal bank account uh, when she opened a business, right? And then on the first of October, she she rented a shop uh, and paid two hundred pounds. So there are two transactions here. And if we want to use this journal, what we'll do is we have to record them in chronological order. So the first one was 1st of October. So we identify it by, by stating the date. And then we know that the cash account increases and the capital account increases. So we identify those accounts. And we indicate uh, how much and we indicate um, the, the, whether it increases or decreases, we indicate it by putting under the debit or the credit column. Okay, and then we have a short description of that particular transaction. In this case, it says to record capital contribution by H. George. We increase our cash by debiting five thousand. We increase capital by crediting five thousand. Okay, and what we do from there is to then update the uh, ledger account. Okay, so that we debit cash, uh, the cash ledger account, and we credit ca uh, the uh, capital um, ledger account. Okay, and we do the same for uh, rent, which was also paid on the first of October, twenty X two. So in this case, it's a reduction in cash of uh, two hundred pounds, two hundred dollars, and this is recorded as a decrease in my owner's equity. Uh, and by a recording uh, an expense, so I debit my expense by two hundred dollars. Okay, and I just do a short description to say that it's payment of rent for the shop. And from there, what we do is that we then post it. The word is post, right? To put post it to uh, the relevant account, so the credit side to the cash, and the debit to the rent expense. So this is the process by which we undertake um, this, this book of original entry. So from invoice, we put it to, through to the journal. We call this journalizing the transaction. So when you put tra this insert transactions into the journal in chronological order, it's called journalizing. And from the journal, we then post it. So it's called posting to the um, relevant ledger accounts. Okay? So, so what's the purpose of all that? Is that, um, remember the ledger accounts are all spread out, they are all in stacks, uh, so we can't keep track of the account equation uh, just by looking at stacks of, account, uh, of, of accounts in the ledger, but we can keep track of the accounting equation by looking at each journal entry to make sure that the debits and the credits are uh, in, in balance. So what we've discussed is journals are book of original entry. They are um, either also called book of prime entry. Um, and it's very useful to have journals because it provides uh, in one single place um, all the transactions that occur uh, and they are in chronological order so you can track them, you can make sure that you, it's complete. But there is one particular problem that needs to be solved because a business would have literally millions and even billions of transactions if you look at it over one year, right? So if we put everything into the journal, then your journal will be really, really, um, you know, unwieldy and, and it's, it's large and it's very thick and it's, you know, difficult to, to manage. 
So what happens is that um, over the years, what we've done is we've created uh, special journals. We've actually taken some journals, some transactions out of uh, that particular journal uh, uh, book. Um, these transactions are normally those transactions that are repetitive in nature, that we'll do you know, transactions that happen very, very uh, a lot of time over the, the life of a particular business over, over one year. Uh, and their entries are the same. Right? For example, when you make sales, uh, all your sales entry would be either you, you increase your assets by debiting your asset and credit sales, increase your sales, or you uh, debit your debtor, increase your debtor, uh, credit sales when you have a credit sales. So sales transactions are numerous. You sell millions of things every day. So your tr the transaction is the same. So it's not efficient to actually repeat these same transactions over and over again in your journal. So we create a special journal that has got less information and, and has got a, uh, a simpler form. All right? And that goes for things like purchases, cash receipts and cash payments as well. So these are called special journals. And those non-repetitive, <coughs> excuse me, those non-repetitive uh, transactions are then uh, left into the normal journals, which we call the general journals. So um, I'm going to show you now an example of a special journal for sales. Some people call it sales journal. Some people call it sales day book, but it means the same thing. Uh, and what you have here is just to go through it with you is that again it's in chronological order so on the far left you have the date of each transaction but the transactions are all the same they are actually credit sales sales that you make to your customer uh, but they are not paid yet by the customer so they are on credit so on, on in the second column you have the specific customers that you have uh, sold to so you have electrical retailers, you have Smith retailers, and you have general retailers. And then on the third column there, you have your invoice number. This is your source document, right? Um, and then you have the folio. You don't have to be bothered too much with the folio. The folio merely represents a uh, reference number to, for these, um, these um, uh, customers. But on the far right, which is important, is the amount of sale of each, for each customer, okay? So, so for the month of June, let's say, for this company, there's already four sales uh, undertaken to these three customers. Excuse me. And, um, and uh, the, the transaction is all the same, as I said. So you have to debit your uh, debtors and credit your sales. Okay? So um, what, we, what we do, therefore, is that we don't have to, we literally don't have to post this into our general ledger every day. And what we can do is we compile it first until the end of the month and only at the end of the month we take the figure in total so this is a journal and we take the, fo the, the figure in total there and then we post the total uh, to credit the uh, sales in the ledger account and debit the trade debtor or some books call it trade receivable uh, in, in the general ledger all right so so the this document is a journal, but this journal will be only posted to the ledger maybe once a month because the transactions are all the same. Okay, so so that's essentially the function of of a, of a special journal to simplify the transaction so that you don't have to enter it every day. So so this would be what we do, and and you now have a total sales of one thousand eight hundred sixty and a total debtor of uh, one thousand eight hundred sixty. But having said all that, it's, it's still not good enough because you, you don't have details of the individual data which you need to keep track of. You need to actually um, you know, make sure that they pay and you, if they don't pay, you have to track them and all that. So it's important that you keep separate records for these customers as well. So what happened, and you can't have it in the general ledger because the general ledger are all total figures for that month. So what you do is you create um, you, you, what we call sub-ledgers or subsidiary ledgers which comprise um, the individual debtors. So one account for electrical retailers, one account for Smith, one account for General. 
and uh, these uh, you know then we post to these individual ledgers uh, debtors accounts the amount that uh, these customer owe us so in the case of electrical retailers uh, they owe us 450 uh, 600 for Smith and uh, 250 for general and then uh, on the 28th another 560 for uh, from electrical retailers all right so this is this these items are posted every day um, but only into the the debtors uh, accounts now this this individual debtors account are called subsidiary ledgers right because it's not part of the general ledger it merely supports the general ledger and what the, which account it supports it it supports the trade debtors account so the trade debtors account is a control account it contains all the amounts of all the debtors in total that owes the business all right um, it doesn't want to have too much detail because if it's too much detail in in a very very thick general ledger it will be very very difficult so the details will be off the general ledger and into separate subsidiary ledgers okay and these subsidiary ledgers are individual accounts and if you add all the balances of the subsidiary ledger it will equal to or it must equal to the total of the uh, uh, trade data account in the general ledger so so that's why it, the the total account is called a control account because you know we, we can we can monitor and we can check that all the entries have been properly posted uh, you know because the 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 summation of all the subsidiary ledgers must be equal to the control account so this is some of the uses of the sales journal uh, which is a special journal so there are purchases journal as well and there are cash book journals uh, cash receipt journals cash payment journals as well so uh, subsidiary ledgers here some some definition is a is a group of individual accounts uh, which if you sum them all up it will uh, add up to the amount recorded into in the control account in the general ledger all right uh, I would like what I would like to stress that the subsidiary ledger is not part of the general ledger it's it's a supporting to the general ledger the control account is a general ledger account and it supports the detail of uh, it's supported by the detail of the subsidiary ledger so there you are uh, the topic on uh, journals and and ledgers which is a process that is important to facilitate the way we uh, update the transactions into the ledgers uh, and we talked about journals we talked about special journals we also talked about subsidiary ledgers um, in the next part part two of this this lecture three we will then look at um, how we um, calculate the balances of each account and then post it to uh, or transfer it to the various reports that we have so i'll see you in in part two all right